Uh, what were your goals coming into this reconvened session? My goals were to hopefully get some legislation out that would offer protections for uh, bodily autonomy is a term that we used a lot or that we heard a lot in these committees because I do think that's important of a person being able to make their own choices about what is in input into their body and so there was a lot of fear and concern in my district and in districts throughout the state and so I was hopeful that we would be able to agree on some legislation that would offer that to the citizens of Idaho. And then what were some of your concerns coming in? Concerns of, of government overreach specifically from the federal government and how egregious that appeared of them forcing uh, employers to require vaccines of their employees upon the losing their livelihood. That's a serious consideration. Um, trying to rectify that uh, contradiction between private business and then personal rights, if you will, in, in that sense. And that's a, a tough ask sometimes. You know, philosophically, we talk about the free market, many of us do, but then there's also what is a, a higher value, the, the private right or the business right, and I was landing on that private right in that sense. So I think that those were some of the difficulties coming in of uh, just trying to balance all, all interests as best we could. And you were very involved in the process this week. You are the chairman of the House Business Committee, which heard a total of eight bills on Monday, um, all focused around vaccines. And of course, you don't have time here to go through all five hours of testimony, right. but across those bills and across the many hours of public testimony, what themes emerged to you? Most of the themes were what I just stated, really. A lot of it was the, the deep concern and, and fear that people had about losing their job or something being forced on them or their family members that they didn't want to do. And uh, then there was some concern about what that policy would look like going forward that we'd heard expressed from legislators after people had testified or with the, the specific pieces of legislation we heard in doing that. Vaccines aren't something we hear about in the business committee quite a bit, but because those specific pieces of legislation touched the business community that we deal with that it came through our committee, which was sort of interesting. But um, I think most of the legislators were aware of, of what was at stake and were trying to make the best decisions. And, and it's always important to me that the public is heard. So that may have been why it went on a little longer. I do not like cutting off public testimony. And I try and be as generous as possible while maintaining the committee's attention and making sure we're not losing people. For sure. Yeah, those marathon sessions can go on yes. for a while. Um, ultimately, you ended up passing, I believe it was three bills onto the floor and a number went for amendments. Correct. So, of course, this is an ongoing process, but do you expect some of these proposals to come up again come January when the session reconvenes? I do think so. Um, I don't know if they will be, well, they'll always be pertinent. It's important. This, this exposed another little weakness maybe in some of our state laws and something that we need to address. But a lot of the big push was the deadline that's coming up on December 6th for the CMS portion of the federal mandate and what that'll mean for a lot of healthcare providers here in the state and having to make that choice between taking the vaccination that they don't want to take or, or losing their livelihood in that sense. So there was a push to get things done by that point. That will somewhat be moot by the time we get back here. But I think going forward, we still need to put some protections in. And so the House did pass a couple of bills, but your neighbors across the rotunda in the Senate ultimately decided not to pass any bills. Um, were you disappointed that more bills didn't make it through the process on the Senate side or that nothing was passed? I was. I was hopeful we would get something done, that, that everybody would see the need of doing something, uh, maybe even lower level, but just giving some protection to the citizens of Idaho and to give that comfort in doing it. But as we were talking earlier, that's part of our process and we're not designed to move quickly all the time. And when we do move quickly, sometimes there's errors or, or wrong thing comes out. So um, our elected representation demands deliberation and of everybody having their input into what is coming out to govern the state. So I have to accept that. It's frustrating, but uh, that's, that's the way our business is done within our legislature. So philosophically, even though not a lot of new laws were put in place or a lot of official actions were taken, you think there was value in going through the process this week? I do. As when we're using the process as it should be used, then I think there's value. We're serving the citizens in that sense. Um, the House moved on some things and, and the Senate chose not to. And again, that's, that's our system and it is frustrating and I think we need to do things, but we have to trust what our founders of this state and the country gave us in that process and that's maintained us for so long. Well, the Senate um, was finished up for the year and wasn't intending to come back, the House did have some unfinished business to address this week. Um, you are the chairman of the House Ethics Committee, which authored a recommendation to um, censure Representative Priscilla Giddings earlier this August. Um, that was ultimately approved by the House after a very long debate on Monday. Can you give me an overview of this incident and what sort of message the House Ethics Committee wanted to send? Um, 
it was difficult. It's not easy. We don't ask to be on that committee. That's uh, our peers elect us to that committee because of the trust they have for us and our judgment. And it's never anticipated to go to the extent that we had to go to this year. And um, that recommendation came after a long period of deliberation within the committee and was something that seemed to be appropriate for maintaining trust and, and honesty within the body in doing that. And ultimately that decision is up to the body. That's how our house rule is, is uh, structured, that it's not one person or one group, but it comes before the body. Is this how we want to be perceived to the public? That's how I read that rule. And, and so we as a committee are the first filter in making that decision, but ultimately it's the body. And is this, do we think this member's conduct is unbecoming and would reflect negatively to the public? And uh, that's, again, process. We followed our rules, it went through the process, and that's what I'm pleased with regardless of the outcome. And during the debate on the floor, some uh, representatives were trying to ask questions about that process that you referred to, um, but some the members of the committee declined to take those questions during the debate. Um, and you kind of referenced, this was a really fraught, emotions were high incident that the House Ethics Committee typically does not end up dealing with. So. Now that, the report, now that the report has been adopted and things are starting to move forward, how are the relationships within your caucus following the incident? Um, I think they're where they were before, Logan, I'll say that. Um, I had some members come to me that voted against the resolution and felt that they had to explain their uh, vote, and, but they didn't have to, and that's what I let them know that. That's up to them, they're responsible for their vote, and it's not for me to, um, well, we can have a discussion on it, but I, did, I didn't, wasn't holding anybody accountable for something. That is something that they can talk to their constituents about, and I don't question that. So I think there were probably some frayed relationships prior to that vote, but I don't think those have been frayed any further, <laughs> meaning that there are probably still difficult relationships there going forward, but I think there is a sense of relief from the body in general that, that now that's over with because it was kind of looming over us for a little bit and the fact that we're coming back to take on a very big topic for all of Idaho and then we had to deal with this also and it just added a, a very difficult dynamic I think to, to this week. But it is over. Yes. <laughs> the books are closed. The uh, both chambers of the legislature adjourned sine die on Wednesday, but we are talking now on Thursday afternoon where a regular interim meeting for the Committee on Federalism uh, just took place, and you are one of the co-chairs of that committee. Overall, what are, what are the goals of the committee that you chair? Uh, the goals are to look at federal actions and to see if they comply with uh, constitutional authority. Is the federal government reaching into state policy or, or state governance where it doesn't have the authority to do that? And it's something that has become increasingly important, and not just because of our current administration, but even Republican administrations and previous administrations. The federal government continues to grow and insinuate itself into state policy. So we are trying to get accurate answers and investigate what that looks like, how the state can react to it, where we do have authority to say no, and where we're stuck, in a sense. So today was another good day of hearings. We had hearings earlier in October for a few dealing with the vaccine mandate and had a lot of good information brought to the committee and we had another good meeting today. And what were some of those topics that you heard from today that you got presentations on this week? Right, so today was mainly focused on some executive orders dealing with decarbonization and getting rid of fossil fuels essentially. And, and so we wanted to hear from our major industries within the state how that might affect them being uh, farming, mining, timber, and banking because there's a lot of banking regulation that's coming in also to promote a, uh, what's called environmental social governance and it, it will affect b um, many industries in, because a lot of industries have to have that capital flowing in in order to go and do projects and we heard a lot about that today. Um, a lot of what we heard is that it's still unclear what the actual rules are going to be. There's the overarching executive order that gives concern but there's nothing really specific we can put our finger on yet. So kind of a moving target there. Correct, but still um, I think another general consensus was that things are going to cost more because it's going to cost more to comply with these rules going forward if they come to full blossom, if you, if you will, in doing that. And of course the Idaho legislature is very much in favor of small government and less regulation, but we are seeing the impacts of rising temperatures and climate change. Um, is it enough for the industry to be policing itself or do you think there is a place for some sort of government oversight? So I think independent groups have been very effective at changing public opinion over the years uh, about environmental concerns specifically. I think uh, since the 
I was young in the 70s and, and the image of the crying Indian over the, the river with, that was filled with trash, but I think that resonates with people when they become aware of it. So I think they have done a good job of using their platform as private industries or private organizations in educating the public and then reaching out to businesses as well. I don't think that's necessarily an area for government to be involved in. I think a lot of it is ideological, um, but uh, there's been a positive effect. I won't deny that is everybody loves clean air and water. And we don't want to see those things in doing that. What we did hear a lot of today is our major industries are aware of that and they've been working for years to have cleaner processes in what they're doing and make sure that they're not damaging the environment and when that issues are brought to them they make those changes and going forward they will continue to make those changes and that's positive to hear. They're not asking us as a state to allow them to do things that are damaging when the federal government is trying to regulate them. They are aware of that and doing the best they can to be responsible with the environment as well. And between the last couple months of the Federalism Committee, between the last week of the reconvened session, what topics and issues do you see coming up when y'all come back to Boise in less than two months oh for the regular session? <laughs> Sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but you are oh, coming back. It's not back. that long, right? Um, there'll be a number of topics. So gonna, I will obviously be dealing with mandates again. Uh, just probably longer conversations now and different nuances to what we're, we're hearing I think there's there'll always be a lot of topics. I don't know if the Federalism Committee is going to have any specific recommendations. I know we want to dig in a little further to all the federal dollars. We talked about that again today, but what are those strings attached to the federal dollars? What are we required to do if we take this money in? And with our coffers being flushed somewhat at this point, if that's going to continue, maybe we can extend that distance between us and the federal government by not taking dollars for certain portions of our budget and our economy and, and funding those things ourselves so that we're able to make those decisions without their input. All right. Representative Sage Dixon, thanks for your time today. Thank you, Logan.